Act 3, Julius Caesar. Uh, the exposition, for the most part, is done. Uh, we are building the rising action, rising action to one of the climactic moments. This is a play that I feel there are a couple climactic moments, uh, but this is one of those huge heightened moments that if you're going up rising action, oh, we have a climax, okay, great, great, oh, build up, and we'll have another bigger one at the end. But we need Caesar to die so that we can see what Brutus is going to do about it. Um, this is the most famous uh, this and the next, rather, are the most famous scenes of this play. Uh, this is seeing the death of, of Caesar, but most importantly, uh, Brutus's motivation, his reaction, and how he controls the masses afterwards, and then we'll see Mark Antony, his emergence as a real character. And remember, Cassius wanted to kill Marcus Antony. Okay, not Marcus Antony. No. Mark Antony, rather. Um, he wanted to kill him, and then he said, no, no, don't worry about it, he's harmless. It's like hacking a limb off a body after you take the head, he's point it's pointless. We don't want to be butchers, okay, we want to be purgers. And so, this is really that, that discovery of, of uh, you know, Antony and, and Brutus uh, in these next uh, couple scenes. So pay particularly close attention uh, to that. Um, so scene one, uh, the capital in Rome, the Ides of March, it's still... So the capital in Rome, the Ides of March, it is the same day uh, that all of this other stuff is happening. We know that this is the scene that's going to end it all. So we have this real rising action, rising action. Um, we'll see Caesar being interrupted by that soothsayer who's trying to wave at him and, and talk to him. Artemidorus trying to get him that letter. So all of these things, if he just took the time and listened to them and read them, he might be safe or at least cautious enough to uh, maybe retreat home or distance themselves from these people just so he can maybe refocus, you know, but he doesn't. He doesn't. That's where we, uh, you know, his, uh, his, his flaw occurs. Um, on page, uh, on the next page, if you just look quickly, around line 60 and, and uh, 70, um, the, the stabbing comes pretty quickly. Um, Caesar, I want you to remember, we're watching this on stage. How can they get close to him in order to do the deed? Okay, look at how they, um, you know, have kind of uh, doctored up or covered up their motive in order for them to get close to him and then stab at him. Once he's dead, I want you to look at the immediate reactions of the individuals. Look at what Brutus says, what Cassius says. Look at the actions that they do. Does it sound kind of familiar to Calpurnia's dream? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that. Uh, but a very, uh, very important, important scene, especially when uh, you know around, around line 150 or so, Mark Antony shows up, who was that loyal supporter of uh, Caesar, and you'll get to see what the individuals, um, you know, what Antony has to say, and you know, getting his questions answered. So um, just a lot of action on this particular scene, a lot of suspense because of whether this is going to work or not. Um, Act three, scene one. Act three. Scene one, the capital in Rome, the Ides of March. Flourish. Enter Caesar, Brutus, Cassius. Act three, scene one, the capital in Rome, the Ides of March. If you can follow along, please. <clears throat> We see Caesar, the Ides of March are come. I Caesar, but not gone, me. You haven't survived the day. Not that he remembers a month ago being told this in the street by somebody, but yet we know that there's a little bit of subtext, a little message there uh, in the soothsayer. Even Artemidorus, hey, read this, schedule, document, read this that I've written. And he pushes him uh, aside, delay not Caesar, read it instantly. You need to do it, you need to do it. Um, and then uh, after he pushes them off, he enters the capital, the rest following. And this is an interesting moment. This individual called Popelius, uh, this senator who is not a conspirator, he stops Cassius and goes, I wish your enterprise today may thrive. Oh, what enterprise? Cassius is playing dumb. Because if other senators not in the conspiracy know something is up, that what they're going to do... Well, that's not good for them, because maybe Caesar even knows. So this is not good. 
Popelius, fare you well. Brutus comes up. What did uh, Popelius say? He wished today our enterprise might thrive. I fear our purpose is discovered. Look how he makes to Caesar. Mark him. Because then he went straight to Caesar and he's whispering, Casca, be sudden, for we fear prevention. Brutus, what shall be done? If this be known, Cassius or Caesar shall turn, uh, never shall turn back, for I will slay myself. So look how he's over the, oh, he's, what's he whispering? Oh no, he's probably telling them. Well, if he does that, Casca, better ready, because we've got to do this quick. Because Caesar's going to die here today, or I'm going to kill myself. So he's really, you know, there's a lot of stress and pressure happening. Brutus says, Cassius, calm down, be constant. Popelius Lena speaks not of our purposes, for look, he smiles, and Caesar doth not change. So if Caesar was being told that so-and-so is going to kill you, wouldn't you kind of react a little bit differently than just sitting there listening to this person? One would think. Um, good. Cassius says, uh, Trebonius knows his time, for look you, Brutus. He draws Mark Antony out of the way. Mark Antony, you can just imagine standing there, standing guard to some degree, just standing next to Caesar. So Trebonius, one of the conspirators, the one that Caesar says, stay near me so that we can talk, he knows his time because he's taken Mark Antony. Hey, buddy, I need to talk to you. Come on, let's, let's go over here. Let's go. So now Caesar is, for the most part, alone. And then we have kind of the proceedings about what's going on, what would normally happen. Um, and we see that uh, Metellus Simber, uh, most high, most mighty, and most um, uh, Hussein, uh, Caesar, uh, powerful Caesar, Metellus Simber throws before thy seat a humble heart. So he's getting, so he's pleading and begging for the return of his brother. Okay, who was who was cast out in exile? Uh, Caesar allowed that instead of death. He, he sent him away. So he's begging and pleading. So he's close to Caesar. He's kneeling before him. And Caesar goes, oh, I must prevent these simber. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men. And we already know that Caesar does not consider himself ordinary. So line 40, to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed from the true quality with that which me melteth fools. Thy brother by decree is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur, so I kick you to the curb like a dog. Out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will be satisfied. So without a really good reason why, I'm not going to do that. See, I banished him once. I banished him for a reason, and now you're begging for me to, to change my decision? Why, was I wrong? Was I mistaken? I'm Caesar. I don't make mistakes. Um, and so Brutus comes close. Now imagine this. Visualize this. We have Caesar sitting there. We have Metellus kneeling in front of him, and Anthony's not present. So imagine Brutus coming closer to him. And he says, I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simber may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What? Brutus? Then Cassius steps up. Pardon, Caesar. Caesar, pardon. So everybody is publicly saying, we want this person not to be banished anymore. But as each person, new person talks, they move closer and closer and closer. And you can just imagine him being swarmed at some point. Um, Caesar's response, line 58. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me but I am constant as the northern star. I will not bend. I will not change. I am Caesar. I was not wrong. Okay? It's not going to happen. Um, that I am constant. Line 73. That I was constant. Simber should be banished. And constant do remain to keep him so. Then we have a new person. Sit up. Oh, Caesar. Hence, wilt thou lift up Olympus? What do you guys want me to do? This is impossible for me to do. I'm not going to do that. And so as people, dear Caesar, doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak, hands for me. So we have all these people surrounding him until Casca delivers the first shot. Speak, hands for me. He stabs. And then on stage, this is very quiet. Okay, if you've ever seen a movie where somebody gets knifed, it's not like, bang, a gunshot. It's very, maybe even not even noise. It's just slowly insert. It might be a noise. 
and, and a withdrawal. It might be it. And so this would be people just grunting and, and Caesar's wound. I mean, it's just stabbing, stabbing. And finally, this is the most famous line in the play. Uh, Caesar goes, et tu, Brute, and you also, Brutus, and you too, everyone else, and you. Because Brutus, everybody thinks so noble of Brutus. He is so up there that for you to, to do it too, that is the worst blow of all. And that's the biggest, the biggest knife wound. Then falls Caesar, and Caesar dies. Immediately, liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. Some go to the common pulpits and cry out, liberty, freedom, and enfranchisement. So these pulpits, like in church, places people speak. So they have these little places, and not stools, but little like stages people can stand and deliver news and orations and speeches and stuff. And so it's spreading out. Go to the pulpit, Brutus. Yes, and Cassius must go. Where's Publius? Here, I'm quite confounded by the mutiny. So I'm here. I, I, I don't know what's going on. Everybody just decided to kill our ruler. No one told me what's happening, so I'm a bit confused. Relax. Relax, Publius. No harm is intended to your person, nor to no Roman else. So it was just a killing of Caesar. Um, good, 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 good. Notice on the next page, line 105, Brutus says, Stoop. Romans, stoop and let us bathe our hands in Caesar's, Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords. Then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons over our heads, let's all cry, Peace, freedom, and liberty. Does this look a little familiar to what Capernaum's dream was? And what Decius said was, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, Caesar's wounds and everybody bathing and washing in the blood? And now it actually happened. So we had those moments uh, come to fruition. So Cassius, stoop then and wash. And this is just a neat little moment. I love this line. It goes, how many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet to know? This is a very important moment in history, not just for Rome. And for how many ages and eons and years will this be reenacted? And our story be told in places not even discovered, in accents that aren't even heard yet or created. Which is kind of interesting because this happened, you know, B.C. America wasn't America for another 1,700 years. Give or take some. A few decades, right? And yet, aren't we reading this? Not necessarily reenacting as a play, but this play is produced. And so it's almost like, wow, look how important it truly was and Cassius was correct on that. Um, the bottom here this is where the, the scene takes a, a big shift. Um, we see Mark Antony's servant show up and it's really to find out what's going on because Antony heard what happened and he took off obviously because uh, there's nothing he can do against a whole bunch of people. So line 125, Mark Antony, he bade me say Brutus is noble, wise, valiant, and honest. Caesar was mighty, bold, royal, and loving. Say, so tell Brutus that I love Brutus and I honor him. Say that I feared Caesar, but I honored him and loved him as well. If Brutus will vouchsafe, vouchsafe that Anthony, so if he will allow Anthony that he may safely come here to be resolved, to, to find out what's going on, how Caesar hath deserved to lie in death, Mark Anthony shall not love Caesar dead so well as Brutus. Looked. So, um, will you give me safe passage, is what he's saying, to come and find out why you guys did this? Because I'm really confused. And if you give me good reasons, I will not love Caesar and dead nearly as much as I love you, Brutus. And so he's willing to kind of pledge his allegiance to Brutus and the people in charge. Well, that doesn't sound very loyal to Caesar, like everybody thought. And so we see uh, uh, Brutus... Tell the servant that uh, the master is a wise and valiant Roman. I never thought him worse. Tell him to please come unto this place. He shall be satisfied and by my honor depart untouched. So he will be saved. 
And so that's why we see Anthony show up here in a little bit. Um, look at Brutus's line. I know that we shall have him well to a friend. He's going to be a good friend for us. Cassius, I wish he may, but yet have I a mind that fears him much. This is so important. Cassius is the one who wanted to kill him originally. Even now, he's like, I still fear him. I'm still not con convinced that he should stay alive, but we'll go with it. Because we'll see at the very end of this act, uh, excuse me, very end of the scene, that Mark Antony should be feared. Because he is going to lead, in his opinion, a revolution of just carnage and gore uh, to fight back for, for Caesar. And so all of this, up until now, is going to be an act. And we will see that play out here in just another page. Um, look at page 818, line 150-ish. Mark Anthony shows up. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death hour, nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. And so if I am supposed to die too, there is not a better time within the hour of Caesar's death and kill me with the swords that killed him with his blood. That would be the perfect day. If I'm supposed to die, kill me now and I will be happy. I will be happy. Um, if I lived a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt, so ready to die. No place will please me so. Brutus, oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. Thou now, excuse me, though now we must appear bloody and cruel as by our hands, yet see you but our hands, and this is the bleeding business they have done. Let me tell you why we did this. Why? What happened? Um, I really like line 182. It talks about, uh, and then we will deliver you the cause, the reason, the explanation, why I, that did love Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. Oh, I doubt not of your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. First, Marcus, so Anthony's walking around, shaking the blood-covered hand of every conspirator, welcoming them. I shake your hand. I shake you. I shake you. Line 191. My credit, my reputation, now stands on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must conceit me, that you must consider me, judge me, that you must think of me, either a coward or a flatterer. That I did love Caesar, oh, tis true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Anthony making thy, his peace, shaking the hands? So I know I love Caesar, and if Caesar's spirit's looking down at me shaking your hands, it's killing him more than the action just did. I did love him. But if you tell me reasons why that I should be happy that he's dead, I will pledge my allegiance and support to you. So that's why you might think me a coward or a flatter, but I want you to know that I am sincere in what I say. Cassius, even on the next page, 215. I blame you not for praising Caesar so, but what compact mean you to have with us? So what are your plans, Anthony? And this is one of those lines where you can tell Anthony has this little underscore, this little, um, you know, ah, that's not... I'm going to test him right here. I'm going to test him. Will you be pricked in number of our friends? Or shall we on and not depend on you? We need to know what's going on. Line 220. Friends, am I with you all and love you all? And upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. I will be everything you want me to be. Just tell me why you did it. Just explain to me what led you to this. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. So not only are they good reasons, but if you were his offspring and we did this and we told you why we did it, you would be okay with it. You'd be okay with your dad being killed because you would agree with us so much. Um, Cassius to Brutus. There's an aside here. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. 
do not consent that Anthony speak in the funeral. All Anthony wants is a chance to speak at the funeral, and the funeral is a public spectacle where we get to address the crowd. And that's the only thing that Ant uh, uh, Mark Anthony has asked for, the ability. And Brutus says, that's fine. And Cassius is like, I, do we really want to do that? Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? Hmm. Okay. And here's his plan. Here's how Brutus is going to allow it. I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Anthony shall speak, and I will protest. He speaks by legal permission. So I will talk first. I will warn them about Anthony. I will warn them that we have allowed him to speak with our permission. So that's a good way to kind of keep everybody under our thumb. And so we won't be lying to them and they'll know what's going on. Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. Oh, Cassius, I know not what may fall, but I like it not. I don't know what's going to happen. In, in essence, this is a Star Wars reference. Of, I have a bad feeling about this. Okay, it shows up in almost every movie. I've got a bad feeling about this. This is a bad idea. And this is going to come back where they should have listened to Cassius. He had all of these feelings and thoughts, and they could have saved a lot of headaches if they would have done that. Brutus says to Mark Antony, Mark Antony, here, take you Caesar's body. You shall not, in your funeral speech, blame us. So this is important. You can speak, but these are your rules. You shall not blame us. You speak all good you can devise of Caesar, and say you do it by our permission. Else shall you not have any hand at all about funeral. So you can say all you want good about him, but you can't say anything bad about us, and you must tell them that you speak by permission of us. If you can't do those, you don't get to speak. Okay, deal. I will do that. Be it so, I do desire no more. Good, prepare the body then and follow us. Now, this soliloquy here is Antony, one of his most famous. Okay, this is the moment where we find out that he is a very impassioned individual. We can see that he was playing those other people for fools and chumps for the last couple pages. Um, and we see this from the beginning with the, with the body. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding spot, piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy. So over thy wounds I swear. I see this vision, and this is what's going to happen. Look at the imagery of this. Look at the description of what's happening here. He says that a curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. So he's saying that there's going to be domestic at home, war and civil war, and all over Italy there's going to be all this war and strife. Blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. So people, you're going to be so used to blood and destruction and death that women are going to smile when they're holding their baby cut in four pieces and dead in their arms. And they'll be smiling. They'll be so desensitized to violence and so used to the violence. That's a pretty bloody picture. There's a lot of anger and violence in his words, and that should show you that this is Mark Antony that they should have been fearful of, and Cassius was right to fear him. And so we can only imagine what's going to happen in the next scene when he gets to speak. Oh, he's going to follow those rules. He'll follow the rules because that's he's a man of his word. But when we look at the wording of his speech, it's, it's going to be awesome. And he'll be able to get the crowd in passion to a fury, just like he feels here. Um, he talks about that uh, all pity is going to be choked with customs of fell deeds. So focus uh, the familiarity with cruel deeds, the, the, so desensitized. Um, and Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, with Ati at his side, come hot from hell, shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc. And let's slip the dogs of war. So Caesar's spirit's going to come back from hell. And with the, the havoc, with this, uh, the goddess of vengeance and strife. And they're going to fight side by side. And it's going to be bloody. And it's going to be death to everybody. A very dark 
and violent and graphic okay, soliloquy here, one of the most graphic that I've seen in any Shakespeare, and we see here what fire is burning inside Mark Antony. So even though he might be calm on the exterior for the conspirators' sake, he is going to be fiery on the inside. Um, the last little bit here, a servant shows up, and uh, it's uh, Octavius, uh, his servant. And we spoke about this in our background information. Octavius Caesar is a relative of Julius Caesar. Do you think it's safe in Rome at this time for anybody named Caesar? No, not at all. And so he says that Caesar, uh, Octavius Caesar is coming near. Um, good, good. Caesar did right for him to come to Rome. Oh, he received the letters and he's coming. And then the servant sees the body. Oh, Caesar! Relax, relax. Uh, where is he at? Oh, he's seven leagues from Rome, so he's a ways away. Okay, go back to him and tell him what happened. Tell him what, what, what's transpired. Here is a mourning Rome, a dangerous Rome. No Rome of safety for Octavius yet. Hmm. And tell him that. Tell him to stay a while. Thou shalt not back till I have borne this course in the market. So don't go away. Stay there until I have had a chance to speak at the funeral. There shall I try in my oration, in my speech, how the people take the cruel issue of these bloody men. And according to the which thou shalt discourse to young Octavius of the things, the state of things, lend me So go tell him everything. Tell him what you saw. Tell him to stay calm. Tell him I'm going to give a speech. Everything should work out. But just tell him to, to lay low and stay cool for a while. It isn't safe for him. And this is going to lead up to the most famous portion. That scene was big, but this next one is even bigger, where it's his public funeral. Where Brutus is going to speak to a crowd who is angry about Caesar's death. But by the end of Brutus, they're like, wow, Brutus, thank you for delivering us from, from hell, from, from Julius Caesar. Thank you. And then all of a sudden, they bring Antony out, and Antony's facing an angry mob. But yet he's able to get them back on board. And just within you know, 20 or 30 lines, they're able to sway the whole populace of Rome, which is just going to be amazing. So uh, that's where we will go with Act 3, Scene 2.